This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In the early 16th century, the Protestant Reformation revolutionised Christian belief. One radical group of believers were the Anabaptists, who rejected infant baptism and formal clergy and believed that all good should be held in common. They were also convinced, as were others, that the Second Coming was imminent. In 1534, in the German city of Munster, a group of Anabaptists attempted to establish a new Jerusalem, ready for the last days before the Apocalypse. But the city was besieged and descended into tyranny. Books were burned and women were forced to marry. As starvation spread, the city's ruler lived in insane luxury. The horrors of the Anabaptists of Munster have resonated through the European memory ever since. With me to discuss the siege of Munster and its impact are Dermid McCulloch, Professor of the History of the Church at the University of Oxford, Charlotte Methuen, University Research Lecturer in Ecclesiastical History at the University of Oxford and Lecturer in Church History and Liturgy at Ripon College, Cudston, and Lucy Wooding, Lecturer in Early Modern History at King's College, London. Dermot McCulloch, the Anabaptists emerge out of the early years of the Protestant Reformation. Can you begin by setting out how far Martin Luther and the early reformers wanted to go in reforming Christianity before we come to the Anabaptists? Well, what they wanted to do was to make Christianity truly biblical again and go back to the Bible's message, look at the New Testament, and try and line up the church to make it look like the New Testament. So that's Martin Luther, and that's the early reformers. And all the Anabaptists were doing were taking that idea seriously, trying to take the Bible seriously. And the word Anabaptist is a term of abuse. It means rebaptizer, because what they did was to make uh, people baptize themselves again or be baptized again as adults, having been baptized as infants by the old church. And the reason they did that was a biblical one. They looked at the New Testament and they said, you can't find infant baptism in the New Testament. Therefore, if we're going to be serious about the Bible, we've got to make baptism for believers, for adults. But there are lots of other things that they discovered in the Bible, because it is a very remote, alien book, and the church had domesticated it in various ways. Even Martin Luther was horrified by the sheer logic of what they were doing. What did they come out of, the Anabaptists? Did they think they were, that Luther, putting it colloquially and mildly, I mean, would be pleased with what they were doing? They were taking his ideas and, as it were, running with them? Did they think they were challenging his ideas? There's, a f- there's an intellectual ferment going on in the intellectual, with the great intellectual capital of the day, and that capital is religion. Uh, and can you place them more firmly? Anabaptist Luther, as it were, crudely started it, then they come along, they take him seriously. Well, Luther and reformers like him. Uh, thought that they were going to overturn the world in in all sorts of different ways. And they also had a very powerful vision of themselves as prophets. And prophets of what? The end of the world. That's there in Luther's thought. And it's not surprising that people took them seriously. You could say that the first Anabaptists are simply developing that idea. It's not just about rebaptizing people. It's actually announcing that the world is going to come to an end soon. And there are lots of reasons why you should think that in the early 16th century. The Turks are pressing in on uh, Christendom. They appear to be about to destroy it. Surely that's part of God's plan. So it's sort of taking the logic of what Luther and other great reformers thought and just applying it and being very excited by it. And the trouble was that Luther, by now, was beginning to see that things were a little more complicated than that. What other um, uh, end-of-the-world facts were around at that time? The the Turks are pressing in, they're coming towards Vienna, and there's no reason they should be stopped. Nobody else has stopped them. Uh, And what else? Particular plagues, famines... Well, the usual run of plagues and famines. You can always have plagues and famines to make you think the end of the world is coming. But there are big events as well, and you, you need to go a long way from, uh, long way from Germany to Spain and look back to 1492 when the last Islamic bastion fell, Granada. That's a great moment for Christendom. It looks as if that's part of God's purpose. And look what happened then. The Jews were expelled from Spain. Uh, and that made the Jews think that the world was coming to an end. So really, everyone is expecting the end of the world in the early 16th century for all sorts of different reasons. But this is a society which really feels that it's in crisis. And if there is a crisis of all society, then that must be God. God's purpose. Um, this is not just a series of political accidents. 
Charlotte Matthew, were the Anabaptists simply misinterpreting the Reformation mainstream ideas, or uh, can you tell us how they worked out where they got to why they got, and why infant baptism, why the sort of abolition of the, the rejection of infant baptism was such an issue? Going back to something that Dermot said, they're taking Luther's ideas and they're taking Swingley's ideas, Swingley in Zurich, Luther in Wittenberg. Both Swingley and Luther had said that sacraments only work if you believe. And so the logical conclusion for that, for the, for the, for the people who were going to become the Anabaptists, was that therefore if sacraments only work, if they only have whatever effect they have, and Luther and Swingley would disagree on that, if you believe, then you can't say as the child believes. And so you have to argue in that case that you can't baptise until, until children are adults, or you can't baptise people until they're adults, until they can actually show that they believe. <coughs> and so what you've got is a, a, quite a careful reading, I think, of Luther and Swingley's ideas, but moving them further into um, the logical consequence, as, as they saw it, which would be that um, without faith the sacraments wouldn't work. I think the reason that baptiz baptism becomes such an issue is precisely because plagues, infant mortality was enormous. And so for children, for parents of children who had been taught for generations that if their children weren't baptised, they, they wouldn't be saved, to, to say that you couldn't baptise children was actually saying something really terrible about the face of their children if they died unbaptised. And it becomes such an issue that in the empire, baptism is, in adult baptism is actually made illegal. So there's a, a, an edict in 1529 which rejects the teachings of the Anabaptists and which makes it a, pu a punishable crime to baptise adults rather than baptising children. So there's a religious reason. If people aren't baptised, they won't be able to go to the yeah. kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Uh, but is there not a political reason as well that once they're baptised, as ba baptised as infants, they're inside, they're part of the system, they can't... Uh, uh, escaped to put it rather clearly. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, if you see, as for, certainly for Swingley, baptism became part of saying you are part of the church and say so you're part of Christendom. Um, and the Anabaptists have a def very different understanding of what the church is. They think the church is just for the elect, whereas Swingley and Luther and Calvin later will say that the church, the external church, the visible church, is for everybody. And so that people do need to be drawn into it and drawn into living, therefore draw brought in under the civic law, um, the law of living a good life, living a, a life according to the laws of the land. So Anabaptists, through their understanding of baptism also have a different understanding of church and then also a, different, a totally different understanding of the way that church and state relate to one another so that um, you start to see a, a ch an idea of church emerging in which it is just the elect, it's those who are simply, those who are called those who are demonstrating by their lives that they are part of the church who are a part of it and that can be quite separate from the state although in Munster it wasn't as we'll come to see Just to get it in context we have a massive Catholic church which mm -hmm. is still very very dominating mm -hmm. we have a, the breakaway Reformation church which is just growing and a breakaway mm -hmm. of that is the Anabaptists mm -hmm. so that a small bit of a small bit That's right. uh, but nevertheless given the firmness of their ideology like many firm ideologies they gather up other things mm -hmm. so they become not the ideology but the excuse and the trigger uh, for a great deal that's going on. How far that's did true, that but I think, I think it's quite important to, to say that our Lutheran churches that are emerging, emerging and our Reformed churches that are emerging are whole pieces of geography. So we've got the Catholic Church, the sort of the widest, the widest stretch, of stretch of Christendom, but then within that you've got geographical areas which are Lutheran, and then within that you've got breakaway groups or within both of those you've got kind of breakaway groups which are the Anabaptists which are kind of gathering people to them um, and becoming little li little groups um, which are often which are oppressed really right from the beginning because they they pose a threat to the to the Christendom nature of, of Lutheranism as well as, as to the Christendom nature of, of Catholicism so these separatist groups become a, a problem right, to, the, to both Catholics and Lutherans right from the beginning. Lucy Wooding, can we go back to the uh, second coming of Christ in the, in the beginning of the 16th century, the broader sense that, uh, that uh, Dermot mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the last days and so on. But was there a sense in which you had to prepare for the coming of Christ? Is that rather different uh, from the approaching apocalypse? 
not for the Anabaptists. I think it, it's one and the same. Um, and, I mean, if you think of the fuss that we made when we, you know, the year 2000 dawned, um, if you translate that kind of an anticipation and anxiety back to the year 1500 and, uh, and it, its aftermath, um, in an age where people are, you know, are providentially minded, where anything that happens, a thunderstorm, um, just a bad cold, you know, can be a sign that God is not happy with you. You know, they're very, very uh, hyper-aware that um, portents and omens and so on uh, are all around them. Uh, so I think that um, for the Anabaptists, I suppose the real thing I think what we're looking at here is that you have to see the difference between the Reformation that Luther had in mind and the way that his Reformation message is interpreted by the Anabaptists. I mean, Luther was a radical, no doubt, but he's a, he's a theologian, he's a theological radical. Now, a lot of the people we're looking at in this story today are very ordinary people. I mean, Hoffman is a travelling fur trader. Um, some of the characters we're going to come across, you know, one's a baker, one's an apprentice tailor. They don't have the kind of intellectual framework to fit their reading of scripture you know, into. They are taking it, and as, as Dermot says, they're taking it at face value. They're tremendously excited. They take it very, very literally. Um, and so they expect in a much more immediate fashion than perhaps some of the more educated reformers are expecting it. Just to underline what uh, Charlotte was saying about the geographical uh, nature of it, we're talking largely about Northern Europe, North Germany in terms of the Lutheran, mm -hmm. not Northern Europe, so in, in particularly <coughs> Germany in, in the Lutheran mm -hmm. uh, and the Anabaptists. And picking up on the Luther for a moment, because they do break away from Luther, after the peasants revolt in the middle of the 1520s, mm -hmm. Luther turned out, as far as the peasants were concerned, to be a conservative, to be someone mm -hmm. who disowned them. These, he, he was very um, contemptuous of what they stood for and what their mm -hmm. views were. Uh, and so did that um, dismay uh, the Anabaptist that, uh, as it were, not so much great leader, but their inspiration had turned his back on what seemed to be uh, radical views? Well, you would expect it to. And, you know, the 100,000 people who died uh, in, the, in the Peasants' War, uh, you know, you'd expect that to have a discouraging effect. I mean, persecution, disaster, violence, you know, from a modern point of view, you'd rather expect people to be daunted by that. For the Anabaptists, it was entirely the opposite. Because, again, if you look into the Bible, the true prophets of God, um, the early church, the early apostles, they're all persecuted. So for the Anabaptists, the more people persecuted them, the harsher the treatment that was meted out to them, the more they were convinced that they were the chosen people and that they were pursuing the right path. So if anything, the defeat, I think, of the Peasants' War actually you know, strengthens their resolve. It roared through Europe, the Reformation, didn't it, extraordinarily? An uh, extraordinarily short time. Mm -hmm. And the Anabaptists, too, this small, let's call them a sect for the moment, mm -hmm. too, how was it spread? Well, you're over, you're over, we're overturning a massive institutionalised religion with, mm. so with, 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 with a way of looking into people's <laughs> lives, controlling people's lives, giving mm -hmm. them jobs, and yet these people are overturning it in quick order. So how did Anabaptism spread? Well, they're, t they're overturning it, but they're overturning it piecemeal. I mean, we talk about the Anabaptists, and actually they're a very disparate uh, s uh, selection of, of different communities, different groups. Um, I mean, we tend to break it down into three particular geographical areas, the, the ones in Switzerland, um, the ones in the sort of central southern German regions, and, and the ones in north Germany and, and the Netherlands, which we'll be mostly concerned with today. Um, but even within those groupings, you know, there's different people following different prophets, different leaders, and so on. Um, well, give us an example through Melchior Hoffman. Well, Melchior Hoffman travels a lot, um, travels on business, um, and he's a lay preacher. And like most of these people, he begins as a Lutheran. He's very inspired by the Lutheran message. And then he takes it further. He becomes more and more radical. But travelling around, preaching in marketplaces, spreading the word, just as the apostles had done in the early church, um, you know, this, this whips up excitement. Um, particularly in cities, and I think we've got to emphasise the importance of cities here, um, because in a city you will have you know, greater concentration of population, obviously, but also of literacy, printing presses, you know, more means of, of disseminating 
uh, this kind of message. And again, to take you back to the biblical parallel, if you think of how Christianity was spread in the first place, if you think of the, the letters of St. Paul, he's writing to different cities, to Corinth, um, to Thessalonica, you know, to, to little groups of beleaguered Christians in different city communities. And so, you know, the Anabaptists, again, think of themselves in that model. Because there is one, the biggest city of all, in Christian terms, is Jerusalem. Hmm. And the heart of this is Jerusalem. Melchior Hoffman, this furrier who travels, gets his I- the idea in his head that it's not Münster, actually, to start with. It's a different city entirely, Strasbourg, hmm. one of the biggest cities in Europe, one of the great entrepôts, places that cultures meet, people meet, trade is done, and also a very tolerant city. And Hoffman was just so impressed by that, he thought this must be the new Jerusalem. Uh, Strasbourg was likely to become the centre of the early Reformation, a new Rome, perhaps, a new Geneva, a new Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. And so Hoffman preached Strasbourg in the very early 1530s, and unfortunately the city authorities weren't that impressed by being cast as the new Jerusalem, so they chucked him in jail. Mm. Can we begin to focus in uh, on Munster now, Dermot McCulloch? Um, In the 1530s, what was Munster like, and how did the Anabaptists take it over? Well, it had been a a prince bishopric. (coughs) That is, a city of the empire actually run by its bishop as a secular ruler. And the prince bishop had been thrown out. Uh, And so now a a Lutheran sort of reformation was happening. It's very typical of cities of the empire that this should happen. And then one particular leader of that Lutheran reformation. I think we need to go back a little bit further. Um, I think it's really it, the, the problems with Munster really start in 1525 as the Peasants' Revolt comes through, it comes through um, when one of the guilds goes out against one of the local monasteries and um, attacks it, and they um, because they see them as competition, and they um, set up they ask f- they set up 34 articles which they demand the city of Munster the bishop should the prince bishop should sign they throw the, the chapter out of the city and that that's all happens in 1525 so there are already tensions in Munster in 15 in, in the late 1520s and what we've got I think is a, a set of tensions between the guilds in particular the higher clerics so the higher priests um, around the bishop who actually is an ordained bishop <laughs> the, the bishop up until 1532 is not ordained, ever ordained bishop um, and, and the lower clergy and the citizens so there are, some, there are quite a lot of different factions in Munster which are trying to get the upper hand and that's very typical as Dermot says mm. for a pre-reformation city and what we start to see well what we start to see is um, the Lutheran faction starting to gain the upper hand um, in 1532, 1533. Mm. Yeah. Can you just give us a bit more about Munster itself, Darren? Darren? A lot of our listeners won't know what Munster stood for in, in, in North Germany in, 15, yeah. in the 1530s. How rich, how big, how powerful, and so on. Well, big, powerful, right up in the northwest of Germany, and therefore very near the Netherlands, what we would now call the Netherlands or Holland, whatever. Uh, and that means that there are a lot of people who've been involved in this, this world of travelling preachers in the Netherlands who are actually a long way away from Melchior Hoffman's Strasbourg. And so it's very natural for them to look at this great wealthy city with its great cathedral, its its walls, and think, well, actually, this is likely to be the new Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And it's one Dutchman who uh, actually had that idea, not Strasbourg, as Melchior had said, but Münster, the local big city. And his name was Jan Matheson. And what did he do? Where do we go on from there? Can we briskly go through? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to see we've got um, a, a, a particular Lutheran preacher who starts out as Lutheran, emerging in mm. Munster, Ben uh, Bent Waltman or ben, ben, Bernard Waltman, who emerges initially as a Lutheran with Swinglian tender with Swinglian. Um, interests, affinities, so he agrees with Luther except on the matters of the sacraments. He becomes the city preacher in 1532. Lutheran, the city council appoint Lutheran preachers to all the city churches. And then the city council say, against the bishop, we want to have Lutheran liturgy. And Ben Waltman says, well, I don't want to give you Lutheran liturgy, liturgy by now. He doesn't approve of infant baptism anymore. He wants to give them a Baptist, a, 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 an Anabaptist liturgy. And that provides that causes enormous tensions within the city, but it also provides the, the moment for Jan Matthies, who is looking, as, you burn, as, as Dermot says, looking for 
places to preach to, really, um, to start to send out emissaries. And he sends emissaries into Munster in early 1534 so and, and baptises Ben Waldman. So in short order, Munster has, bec- has bec- been a prince uh, bishop, yeah. Roman Catholic, rich city with a great mm-hmm. cathedral. Mm-hmm. Then, because of politics of the council and the politics of religion, mm-hmm. has become Lutheran, mm-hmm. and the politicians... Uh, pressing this on the uh, clergy who, who run the place and mm-hmm. winning all the time. Mm-hmm. And then the next stage, very, very quickly, is mm-hmm. the Anabaptists see yeah. this as a place to That's seize, right. and they seize it. All within it? two years. Basically. Yes, although it's interesting to, to note that the, the big changes that happen in Munster um, happen because, well, partly because of a change in the city council. Uh, and the city council is elected, so you get um, a, a mostly Lutheran council elected um, of February 33 and then a year later you get another lot of elections and by that stage it's a, an entirely radical city council uh, that's elected so it's, it's not as if we're looking at a coup here, there is, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, popular support for what is happening um, but I think the, the radicalising influence comes in from the Le- Netherlands and, and two Jans here, Jan Matthijs and Jan van Leiden, both of them um, followers of, of Hoffman in the first instance, um, and Jan van Leiden is sort of sent on an exploratory mission. Don't, we're not, I don't quite get to him yet. Can we, we don't start get with, to him. <laughs> no. okay. can, um, we, can we start with Jan Matthijs, uh, um, mm-hmm. a Dutch preacher, Dermot? Uh, what, what is it? It's already been, she, he's already been mentioned by Charlotte. Um, they're, they're concentra- Anabaptists are now beginning in that part to concentrate their forces on Munster, and Matthijs goes in as a place to, to take over, although. It, has been prepared. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about him? It seems to proceed, why I'm picking up figures, it seems to proceed by charismatic figures, this, doesn't it? Absolutely. These are people um, whose charisma is more <coughs> evident than their theological scholarship or whatever. He's a traveller, he's a tradesman, and the sort of person who can just attract people around him with uh, an arresting simple message. Uh, come to the New Jerusalem. And so all sorts of people who have been disappointed, as we've said, by Luther, disappointed by the mainstream Protestants, are drawn by this man who seems to be saying, yes, I can show you the way forward. The last days are going to happen. Come here, and we will make them happen. And what you're doing, of course, is is empowering ordinary people in a world where they don't feel they have any power. And people have been uh, driven into a, 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 a state of excitement by the fact they've seen the powers of this world being thrown down, the Pope's power going, the Prince Bishop's power going, those Lutheran councillors being pushed aside by more radical figures. And in that situation, any leader with charisma can step in, and that's what Jan did. Just a second, Lucy, can you just... Do we have any record of what he said, Dermot? You've given us an outline, but do we have any more particulars? He's standing, uh, let us say, in the marketplace. What's he saying? I think Charlotte should tell us that. Charlotte, can you tell us that? Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can, actually, partly because I don't think it's <coughs> Matthies who is doing the standing in the marketplace initially. I think what, what Ma- Matthies manages to do is to get Rortman converted, Ben Rortman, who is this very charismatic and very theologically trained preacher. And we do have, um, we do have sermons by him. Um, And it's fairly clear that his message moves, as I said, he was initially Lutheran, but he then starts to see that that we need to be, or he starts to proclaim, as as you said, the coming of the New Jerusalem, the coming of the coming of of a community in which all people will be equal. Um, and so one of the things that happens very early in, in 1534 um, is that they declare that every, all, all things belong to all people. They have what the Germans call the Gutegemeinschaft, common goods, um, and they burn the city archives so that all records of, of ownership, of land ownership, for instance, disappear. So what we're getting from Wortmann and then with him from Matisse's emissaries is a sense that... Um, the divisions of society, and we have to think of this as a very, very hierarchical society. We have a clerical hierarchy, we have a, a secular or a temporal hierarchy, and that those divisions are being wiped away, and that all people are going to be equal. Who's mm. here coming? I just wanted to make that same point, really, that we're looking at a kind of social radicalism here. Uh, I mean, Luther, when he dresses down, likes to dress in courtly garb. You know, he, he, he becomes very much part of the establishment. These people are much more down to earth. Um, I mean, Jan Matthijs has book burnings, everything but the Bible 
must go. All we need is, is, is the word of God. And of course, the, the whole idea of having goods in common, not a very appealing idea if you're, if you're one of the rich, but a highly appealing idea if you're one of the poor. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, this, this really helps get his message across. Is it possible to disentangle the religious ideological from the social practical? I mean, is, is, no. is it a case of religion triggering or um, being used by people who want change for different, other than religious reasons? I, I, I don't I think, think yeah. that uh, you, they would have understood that question mm. in the way you put mm. it. Mm. Religion is the way that they express all the most important things in their lives. It's not mm. some hobby. Mm. It's how they see the world. Mm. And those who are at the bottom of the pile are now being given a message that, that Jesus Christ does not want a pile. He wants people all in the same place because they're all children of God. And that's why we get back to Luther. Luther had written in 1520 a text called The Freedom of a Christian. And these people take that freedom very, very seriously indeed. And so there's, But they take it seriously in a way that Luther didn't anticipate them taking it. Um, that is, they take it seriously not just as throwing down the difference between spiritual and temporal, but th- throwing down spir- the differences of temporal hierarchy as well. Well, let's turn to the siege now. Um, in 1534, in February, the ousted Prince Bishop of Munster, Franz von Wolbeck, he laid siege to the city, and he laid siege to the city for 18 months. So that is the rest of our story. But also Lutherans alongside him. That's the extraordinary yes. thing, mm. that the Reformation was now so panic-stricken about the Reformation that Protestants were, were helping a Catholic Prince Bishop try and win back the city. Yes. Briefly, at that time, was Munster thought to be a test case? If we can get Munster, we can stop the rot. Oh, yes, very much so. Um, because there's nothing quite like what was happening in Munster anywhere else in Europe at the time, that these obvious radicals were seizing a reformation and discrediting it, of course, in the eyes of the rulers of Europe. That was terrifying for Luther and his friends, that their reformation had been hijacked by uh, subversives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we had John Matisse inside the city. He predicted that the second coming would happen at Easter in 1534. Mm-hmm. It didn't. So what did you do? It didn't. Um, well, the good thing about prophecies is there's quite a few prophecies in the Old Testament which actually don't come true. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's some inspired yeah, preaching. So we've got to concentrate on oh, Mouton at the moment. What, yeah. what did John, what, what did he do? Uh, he... Well, I he know what it does, but I want you to say. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, he had another revelation. And the revelation was that he would go out um, to face the bishop's forces, uh, just him and 12 chosen uh, uh, apostles beside him. Was this a deliberate number? Yeah, I think people think in these these very symbolic terms. And that I think he saw himself as David going out to encounter Goliath. And I think... Or he said that this would unleash a kind of apocalyptic confrontation, and that you know the the, the, the last days would start to unfold from this. And I mean, it's actually quite a pathetic um, scene in many ways. Um, by the standards of the time, he's quite old; he's in his fifties, um, on a lone horse riding out. Uh, and he must have had in his heart the conviction that, you know, this is what God wanted him to do. With the twelve behind him. Mm-hmm. He must have been terrified. Uh, I don't know. Well, perhaps, perhaps they too were carried forward by their godly zeal. Um, and they were hacked to pieces. And, and Munster had lost its profit. So, you know, consternation then followed. Well, what, besides consternation, what, <laughs> what specifically followed Dermot? Well, someone else emerged. If you lost a prophet, you've got to have another one in this situation. And another charismatic uh, uh, young man, in this case, uh, Jan Bokkersen, stepped in to be the new king. And uh, here was a man who was certainly an idealist, but with a very strong idea of what this new community should be like. And that image of David, which you've already heard about, David and Goliath, well... Uh, Jan stepped into this role. He came from Leiden, hence he, in history he's known as John of Leiden. And that name struck terror into Europe for the next century or so. And he took over Matisse's wife, um, Davina, who came from Harlem. Um, and Jan van Leiden then becomes the, the, the person who sees Munster through the next 14 months, 15 months of the remaining siege. 
and on one level he was he was 25 he was born in the same year as Calvin 1509 um, he on one level was, was clearly a very good organiser they held the siege for for until the, the following June which is quite extraordinary given mm. the, the weight of pa- the powers that were outside the city he was also um, a tyrant there's no question about that and one of the things that they that he did having introduced um, having Matisse having introduced the sharing of goods by now in Munster there are three many times as many women as, as men in the city and in, partly in order to keep the women under control Jan van Leiden introduces um, share polygamy um, and a forcible marriage for the, for, for the women who are mm-hmm. some of whom been, who have been left behind by their husbands to, to look after the, the property in Munster some of whom are Anabaptist sympathisers themselves who have come to join to be a part of the <coughs> new Jerusalem um, and Jan van Leiden introduces polygamy. He sets himself up in Matisse's house with a, a, a great palace next door for his own 16 wives, all of whom except one were under 20, interestingly. Um, he keeps a very, very strong, um, strict discipline within the city. Um, he's he stops torture happening, but he's quite capable of summarily executing anybody who stands against his leadership. Mm. And the situation in the, in the city really starts to deteriorate. Mm-hmm. The, the siege starts to bite, and things yes, get yeah. very difficult indeed. Yeah, he's, but he's not just a tyrant, he's a very charismatic yeah. tyrant, and he has an extraordinary sense of theatre. Um, uh, he's supposed to have dabbled in kind of uh, theatricals before uh, this particular stage in his career um, in Munster. And, I mean, Obviously, the, the two eyewitness accounts we have of what happened in Munster are both quite biased because obviously they were trying to distance themselves mm. from, from what and condemn what happened. But according to one account, um, he appeared stark naked in the marketplace one day, um, and nakedness, of course, is a sign of purity. You know, going back to Adam and Eve before the fall. So you know, this was, a, but it's going to get anyone's attention by any means. Um, and he then went into a coma. Or a trance for three days, during which time he couldn't speak, so he claimed, um, and then emerged from that to say, well, you know, we're going to have a new system, they get rid of the council, they bring in 12 elders, and and so on and so forth. But he had a wonderful way of kind of, or a chilling way, if you like, of of trying to sort of get people ready for the latest revelation and then unleash it upon them. He also issued a a gold coinage, which he distributed all through Europe, and you can still see these Mm. coins with his head on, proclaiming that message of the last days. So this really is a statement that this is a king for all Europe, for all Christendom, for all the world. Can we just dwell a little, uh, um, without being too biristic about it, on the <coughs> horrors? It's known for the horrors. Now the horrors happened after the siege of but what was particularly horrific about what he was doing inside that city? Don't well, I think it's the, 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 the insane la- lack of proportion that the city is starving, and yet the court of Jan at the heart of it, the, those wives, are not starving. There's a, an enormous luxury at the centre of it. They gather together a court to honour God, because this is God's representative on earth. But around them, people are just dying of, of mm. hunger and thirst. Uh, people are being executed if they stand up, if they express their despair. It's, mm. it's a nightmare world. It, it, it reminds one of Campuchea in the 1970s. Mm. Uh, and they, they, they say that they wa- took the wa- washed the whitewash off the walls of the churches and sold it to people as milk. Mm. I mean, it, just the level of starvation amongst the people themselves was just horrendous. Mm. The word the word proto fascist has been used. Is there any? Can you give us any indications of why that would be a relevant term? Well, obviously, there are some parallels. Um, the charisma, the whipping up the crowd hysteria. Um, uh, the brutality um, and certainly sort of 20th century interpretations of what happened in Munster very much drew that parallel there's a, there's a famous novel of 1937 um, Bockelson um, which draws a very direct parallel between Jan van Leiden and Hitler both outsiders dropouts in many ways illegitimate coming into Germany you know with this sort of evil dream this, this, this evil ambition um, and when the when the powers around Hitler discovered that that comparison had been made, they got rid of the author. The author was taken to Dachau in 1944 yes. and, and murdered. Um, but I think it's 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 too easy a comparison, really, because you need to put it into 16th century context. Um, 
and it, it's not exactly totalitarian. You know, it's 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 something too religious for that. And I mean, people like Jan Matthijs, you know, were capable of extraordinary brutality, but were then capable of that sort of extraordinary act of self-sacrifice when he he rides out and has himself butchered. Um, so there's something a little different going on, I think. I, I'd say it's Maoism rather than fascism. There's not racism there. There's an idealism. There's an absolute conviction that you can change society completely and the ends justify the means in that. Mm. Given the energy that... <coughs> excuse me. Given the energy that was going on inside the city, um, they did last out for 18 months against an encircling army, uh, quite a powerful army. How did they manage to do that, Dermot? Well, I, partly, I suppose one has to say by fear, mm. but partly because they are very well organised, they have a charismatic leader, they have the resources of a very wealthy city. It takes a quite a while to get through those resources. Mm. Very well defended city, and they added to the defences. So it's, it's a combination of that. You can't get out. Mm. And so there's a desperation. Uh, you, you've got to defend the city unless you surrender. And, and mm. of course, they knew what would happen when they surrendered. Uh, it would be death in very, very unpleasant ways. And so they did surrender. And what happened? They didn't exactly surrender. They were betrayed. I mean, this is the interesting thing, but they, they did mini manage to keep this, this defence up for this extraordinary length of time. And partly, of course, the bishop's troops are you know, a rather motley bunch. I mean, some of them but are But anyway, actually, let's yeah. move on. They, the the okay. city fell, yeah. Um, the city fell because it was betrayed. Yes. And the bishop's men were let in. And uh, there was horrible carnage. Um, thousands of people, we're not sure of the exact number, but certainly thousands of people probably died. Mm -hmm. And the ringleaders were kept back um, for a more symbolic end, for a very unpleasant execution in January of 1536, where they were effectively tortured to death, mm -hmm. because that point had to be made. It is really chilling going to Minster, because you can still see the irons which were heated to red hot, with which their flesh was torn and pinched. Mm -hmm still see the cages in which their bodies were then hung on the, San on the Lambertus Church in Munster as you walk up the main st shopping street in Munster, mm -hmm. there are the three cages in which the bodies were hung mm -hmm. on the church tower So what did that have, what impact did that have on Anabaptism? Well it gave it an image for the rest of the century of crazed barbarity which was actually completely different from the, the nature of most Anabaptists. There was a certain terrorist um, uh, aftermath in the Netherlands. There was a, an organisation called the Battenbergers who did go on attacking clergy and so on. But largely, Anabaptists were appalled by what some of their number had done. Uh, a, a, a priest from Friesland called Menno Simmons gathered the shocked remnants and committed them to pacifism. So the future of Anabaptism and all the radical uh, uh, strands of religion around it was a commission for pacifism for the future, which is still there. They're, they're mm. passionately committed uh, against violence, and that's a result of this particular trauma. What did the conquest, let's say, that of Munster, what effect did that have on the Protestant Reformation, on Calvin, for instance, on the Protestant Reformation? Made it, terrif so made it terrified of uh, that sort of disorder, and Calvin in particular absolutely terrified. So you find, for instance, in, in, the, in the preface to Calvin's Institutes, which is going to be published in 1536, so just 18 months later, or just 18 months, a year later, you find um, him saying quite explicit, explicitly in his preface, to, preface dedicated to the King of France, we're not the kind of Protestants who are anarchists. We're not the kind of Protestants who are going to bring disorder. We are Protestants who respect the order of government. And so... I think it, it really strengthens the magisterial, the prince, the reformation that is supporting temporal order. What other effects spread through Europe from this, they say, this, this terrible event? Well, I think it's a gift to propagandists. Um, and uh, whether you are a Catholic critical of all Protestants, you know, you can, you can use it to, to good effect, as indeed one of the first histories of it, it, it did, um, or whether you're deeply worried by the divisions within Protestantism, you know, you can use it as a warning, this is, this is where things will go, and I think you can use it also as a tool of, of what we would call, I suppose, social repression. Um, and it's interesting that there's a lot of women involved in Munster, and a lot of women who speak out, um, and 
that is seen as subversive, dangerous, and so I guess it, it, it helps people to reinforce the more patriarchal message, um, which is also within Protestantism. Um, and uh, yes, and, and so Anabaptists, if they still have that burning zeal, internalize it and move away and separate themselves off. But the violence and the pacifism, you know, look like they're, they're contradictory. Um, and in actual fact, I think they're the same thing. Anabaptists want to be apart from society, they reject the status quo and they just find a different way of doing it. Was there a sigh of relief, as it were, over Europe, uh, Dermot, when, when, when Munster fell, uh, that that cancer had been removed and the, and the savagery of the slaughter inside and the torture and so on was, was a good cleansing? Was that the feeling? There certainly was that feeling. Uh, rulers all over Europe now could see that Protestants were OK... Uh, this sort of radicalism had been opposed by Protestants as much as uh, it had been by Catholics, and that's very significant. Sure. And you get a sense within Munster itself of wanting now to preserve the new, now re Catholicised status quo. So that the person who, the, the man, the Stadthalter, the man who's in charge of the city, when some of the women from Munster who had been exiled in, after the fall of the siege start to come back the following August, he gets very nervous and, st and, and they immediately take, um, they take measures to make sure that these women are not going to restart something up again. Yes, the women, as you mentioned, Lucy, and we didn't mention it enough in the programme, did play a, a, a strong part, though, didn't they? They had a place in the Anabaptism mm. scheme of things. Yeah, they did, and it's part of the Anabaptism appeal. They, they appeal to sort of basic pleasures, food and sex, you know, forbidden in so many ways by the Catholic Church, allowed by the Anabaptists. Um, and it's interesting that at the end, uh, there's about 3,000 women rounded up, and uh, the bishop says, well, if you recant, you can go free. Uh, and, of course, many do, but many don't. Many choose death. They, you know, they're true to the cause right to the end. Well, thank you all very much. Bit of a shaker. <laughs> 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 thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Charlotte Matthew and Lucy Wooding and Dermot McCulloch. And um, next week we'll be talking about the discovery of radiation through Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, Rutherford and Neil Spohr. And thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this BBC Radio 4 podcast, why not try BBC Radio 3's Arts and Ideas podcast, which includes the highlights of this year's Free Thinking Festival. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.